Good morning, Orchard. I am Holly Joyner, and I'm so glad you're here with us today. Whether you're on site or online, we know that God has something specific that He wants to say to you through His Word. We have had an incredible month discussing all kinds of relationships, but today we are wrapping up our It's Complicated series with a sermon on church relationships. We also have a really amazing personal story that we cannot wait for you to hear, so don't go anywhere. If you're joining us online, right now is a really good time to hit that share button and invite all your friends and family to join in with us. We would also love to see who all is worshiping with us today. So make sure you comment in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. Just a reminder, Baptism Sunday is on April 4th. This is also Resurrection Sunday. We will have services at 8, 9.30 and 11 a.m. If you're interested in taking that next step of obedience and believer's baptism, simply text Orchard Next Steps to 94,000. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday morning service in this building. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, created by Him to do His works, to teach the gospel to all generations every day of our lives, no matter where we are. Our mission here at the Orchard is to be family, to live with purpose, and to make disciples. Service will begin in just a moment, so I want to encourage you, as you worship this morning, to remember the gospel. Remember the true story of God's redeeming love. Reflect on your relationship with Him and whatever it is that you're holding on to, know that you have a Savior waiting with open arms. Give it all to Him today. Isaiah 25 one says, O oh Lord, you're my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Let's prepare our hearts to worship our Lord. Well, good morning, Orchard family. My name is Andrew Hendrick, and I serve our family here as the group's director. And whether you're here with us online or whether you're here with us in person, I'm so glad you've joined us this morning. 
one of the things that I get to do as the group's director that I love doing is getting to meet people, getting to meet our current church family members, getting to meet new people. And so what I'm going to be doing at the very end of the service, I'm going to be out at the group's booth right out in the middle of the lobby. You can't miss me. And I would love to get to meet you and to walk you through the next steps uh, into entering into the life of our groups at the Orchard. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been talking uh, about relationships in our sermon series. And one of the songs we're singing this morning um, highlights part of God's relationship with us in his love. It says, the passion of our Savior, the mercy of of our God, the cross that leaves no question of the measures of his love. And one of those measures of his love is found in Romans chapter 5. So if you would stand with us as we read God's word this morning. It says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. No. Cool. 
morning, everyone. My name is Keith Thomas. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm an, in my year of candidacy for elder, and I get the privilege of praying for us this morning. So uh, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to gather together in your name for the freedoms that we have in this country to worship you freely without fear of persecution, without fear of, uh, of danger to our lives. We pray for our, our brothers and sisters throughout the world that don't have that same freedom, Lord. We pray that you give them encouragement, give them courage in the face of danger. God, we're all part of one body and you've called us here to be part of that body be part of the body that serves together, that promotes your kingdom, and equips others to do your work. Lord, as, as we've learned over these past couple weeks, relationships are complicated, but God, you in the perfect relationship have designed us for relationships, and that includes relationships among the members of the church. God, we thank you for the staff who serve so well. We thank you for community group leaders and volunteers who sacrifice their time to serve their brothers and sisters. Thank you for the deacons, Lord, and for the elders who, who do their best and sacrifice to, to lead well. God, it's complicated. It's complicated. You brought people from all different regions, from all different backgrounds, from all different uh, life experiences, and you, you call them all together for your purpose, Lord, and those, those are inevitably going to bring conflicts, Lord. We may hurt each other. We may hurt each other's feelings because we're imperfect, Lord, but through your grace, we can have unity, and I pray for that unity because we are all members of one body. Lord, I ask these things in your name. Amen. And I 
for you this morning. Lord, we give you our life. God, you've given us every breath. You sent your son to die for us. So Jesus, you are the reason we're here this morning. Jesus, you are who we worship. God, I pray that with every beat of our heart, every breath, God, we would worship you and praise your name. Lord, higher than any other name. Lord, speak to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. When I first moved to Memphis, I didn't really know anyone. I had a sister that lives about 20 minutes away, but Memphis has been brand new to me. And the Monday that I moved here, I drove around the area, saw a few churches, uh, typed into Google church, churches in the area and saw the Orchard Church and saw that there was a Bible study starting that Wednesday. And so I signed up and I joined on in and I showed up. And soon after I met Keith and John and they <laughs> took me around and introduced me to everyone. I got names and phone numbers and people telling me they were wanting to welcome me into their home, welcome me into their life, into their community. And I have been visiting Orchard ever since. What's really stood out to me about the Orchard is I moved from a church family that was super close-knit and they were my people and they were my home. And so leaving that community was really difficult. And it was really nerve wracking to think that I was ever gonna find that again and find another church community where I would feel welcomed and that I could feel like I could serve and that I feel like I could find my people again, find my family. Getting to get plugged in the young adult Bible study, everyone was super welcoming, made me feel a part of the family from the first moment that I walked in and made me feel like I had a home after 48 hours of being in Collierville. And I think that's what stood out to me the most about Orchard and why I've kept coming back is because it's a family and it's a community of people who are invested in not just seeing you come to church on Sunday, but getting to do life with you. There's been like a new sort of sweetness um, found in the fact that we can count it all joy to find joy in trials. And moving to a brand new city, not knowing anyone and not having really any friends, um, has been difficult, but all along and reading through James right now, it just reminded me that the Lord has us in the center of his hand and he's not gonna let go. And finding community already and through all of that has been really cool. And he's been teaching me that like, where he calls me, where he guides me, he will provide for me. Good morning. Welcome to the orchard. How are you this morning on time change? Three of you are almost awake. That's fantastic. Hey, if you're online, good morning. We welcome you to the services. We are so glad that you have joined us. We hope that you will find family, live with purpose, and make disciples. We are in a series called It's Complicated. Relationships are complicated. Today we're talking about church relationships, and in that story, that is one of the most fascinating stories to me ever. Now, there's some things about Carrie that you will learn if you're around her for a little bit. One, the fact that she moved to Collierville and hadn't been here 72 hours and signed up for a Bible study that she found online is incredible. And so she came, and Keith, who prayed for us earlier, he's doing a study group through the book of James, and she knew when she moved to town, she was looking for a Bible study. And so she came, she signed up, didn't know a soul, walked into the building, and Orchard family, what a great job you did. L loving on her, bringing her in, the young adult group bringing her in and inviting her into their homes and showing hospitality and service and all of these things. And so I hope that you will remember, for us at The Orchard, we are a family of missionary servants sent to make disciples of Jesus Christ, but that has practical implications. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Romans chapter 12. In this series about it being complicated, we've talked about everything from marriage relationships, which are complicated, to parenting relationships, which are really complicated, right? To friendships, which are complicated, to friendship with Jesus. And now I want us to talk about relationships with each other inside the church. 
When it comes to the church, I think sometimes we think that the church, we read in the book of Acts and we read about this early church and we think, well, man, they had it all together. They never had any problems. Everything always worked out great. We read in Acts chapter 2 that they devoted themselves to prayer and the word and, and nobody had need and they were meeting together daily and all those things. And I think sometimes we just put a period and say the end. That's the way it always was. But that's not true. And if you continue to read, you find out about financial mismanagement, you find out about relational discord, you find that apostles and elders and people having issues inside the church. Sometimes inside the church, it feels more complicated than anywhere else in life. It's complicated, but Jesus makes it better. In the classic film, almost 20 years old, Ice Age, Think about that. Almost 20 years old, 2002. It, it, there is a scene where Diego, the saber tooth, is hanging on the ledge and he falls. Manfred the mammoth goes, rescues, and throws him back up. And in this moment, he looks and he says, You could have lost, lost your life. Why did you do that? And he said, Well, that's what you do when you're part of the herd, you look after each other. To which then Sid the Sloth says, I don't know about you guys, but we're the weirdest herd I've ever seen. So will you look at your neighbor this morning and say, welcome to the weird herd. We're the weirdest herd I've ever seen. Praise the Lord. I want you to know that when it comes to life in the body, there is unity in diversity. God has given us to each other, and, and there's a part of our Christian life that is meant to be lived out in community. We know that faith that lasts to the end is true, saving faith. And part of what helps us to hold on to that faith is the gift of each other. So this morning, I know that there are some of our Orchard family who are tuning in online from the hospital. I want you to know we love you. We're praying for you. For some that are watching, you're saying, you know what? I'm, I'm hurting. There's relational discord this morning. I want you to know that we love you. It comes to this place where we gather, and sometimes people are at the heights of joy, and sometimes people are at the depths of despair, and you never know what you're going to experience, but we know that you will experience this. By God's grace, you will experience a people who have been made family because of the work of Jesus Christ and being sealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And in this weird herd... God has gifted and brought us together for his good purpose. Jesus is building his church. His church cannot fail. She will be triumphant. But in the already not yet tension that we live in, it's complicated. But Jesus makes it better. In Romans, Paul takes us through this incredible theological part uh, all the way through Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, he breaks into song, into this doxology, and as he comes to the end, for to him and through him belong all things, to him be the glory forever, amen. And then he switches to this pastoral tone, and I love the way that Paul always gives us this deep theological truth, and then he helps us know, and here's what it looks like in practical terms. And he starts with the way it looks inside the church body. So if you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse number 3 and go through verse number 8. Would you stand with me that we might honor the reading of God's Word together this morning? The Bible says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members. And the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in serving the one who teaches. Uh, the one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy. With cheerfulness. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we come by the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father. 
We plead the righteousness of Jesus Christ as our access. We thank you for the confidence that is ours in drawing close to a throne of grace because, boy, we need you. We'll love you in life. We'll love you in death with every beat of our heart and with every breath. Jesus, I confess before these there is nothing good in me except for you. So I pray this day that you help us to delight in you through your word. Teach us, for we are listening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So when it comes to church and church relationships and all the things that go in there, Paul wants us to understand how this works. And so as he makes that turn in, in Romans chapter 12, which we don't have near enough time to cover all of it, we find out that he tells us in light of all these things, and I, I think it's everything, all the previous 11 chapters, in light of all these things, that I want you to present your body as a living sacrifice. I tell people all the time that in theory, I like the idea of being a living sacrifice, but in practice, I find myself crawling off the altar too many times. I want to follow Jesus. I, I want to obey him. I want to do the things that his word says, but I'm supposed to be a living sacrifice, and instead I find myself trying to crawl off the altar all the time. He tells us that we can't be conformed to the patterns of the world. We've got to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, which happens by the Spirit and the word working in us. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, John 17, 17. And these are reasonable acts of worship and service. And so then he, he comes in verse 3 and he says, uh, when it comes to God's grace, God's grace builds community. God's grace builds community. You see, we are the Orchard Church by the grace of God and the kindness of Jesus. And when it comes to this idea, it starts with the fact that grace actually cultivates humility. Look at what he says in verse 3. By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Grace will cultivate humility. Grace will cultivate humility. Humility is one of those places where we struggle, right? We read in Philippians 2 that we see that example of Christ's humility. He humbled himself. He tells us, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more significant than yourselves. This idea of cultivating humility and thinking of ourselves with sober judgment. My children will tell you that if you come to our house and there's homework to be done and any of it relates to math, they're not going to ask me. Math is not my area of giftedness. School's not really my area of giftedness either. But when it comes to this idea, you know, they will come in the house, they'll have a math problem, they may walk in and not realize that Allison is not in there, and so they'll look at me and be like, never mind, where's mom? And it hurts my feeling. You know, just that one, it hurts it but, it, but it's but it's true. But the funny thing is, my parents used to stay on me, and they'd be like, John, have you studied for your math test? Oh, yeah, I've studied, which to me meant I had looked at a page in a book, and I'd done the work that was assigned, even if I got D's on it, I was ready. They would say things like, are you ready for this test? And I'd be like, oh, I'm ready for this test. <laughs> I've got it. And they would be like, well, that's great. We're so encouraged. And then the grade would come home. You're ready for this test? Yes, ma'am, I am. Well, why did you fail that test? I have no idea. I bet it was the teacher, right? I, I know it had to be Miss Knighton. Had to be. Grace is supposed to cultivate humility. We're, we're supposed to assess ourselves with sober judgment. I think sometimes for us, we, we get in these places, and instead of appreciating the grace of God at work in us, instead of understanding the way that he has designed us, sometimes we wish he maybe had designed us a little bit differently. But we have to understand this is not about self-esteem, this is about God-esteem. 
This is about saying, okay, if God has done this in his church, if by the Holy Spirit he has distributed gifts and given them to the body, then in whatever gift he has given, we got to have a sober judgment about that. I remember when I was a kid growing up, we, we would have, you know, when I was growing up, we had a little bitty church, two sets of pews, one aisle down the middle, and, you know, at what I call halftime of the service when they collected the offering, there would be somebody that would sing with a cassette tape. For some of you, you can go to the Smithsonian and look at a picture of what that looks like. And they would sing at halftime, and, you know, we would be kind of like, we're getting ready for the deal. And I remember sometimes thinking that the music director must have never listened to this person before they sang. I remember sitting in the pew, and this dear saint would come up there, they would take that microphone. You would hope that the guy in the back hit play on the cassette on time and that they had rewound it. It wasn't in the middle. It wasn't eating it or whatever else might happen, right? You hope that the microphone was on, and then sometimes people would start singing, and I'd be ready to worship the king, and all of a sudden they'd start singing, and I'd go, mm. <laughs> Instead of worshiping Jesus, I was thinking, somebody needs to talk to that music director about that. Because everybody thought they were a soloist in the choir. And some people were. Some people didn't have much sober judgment about the way that God had distributed gifts, right? Now, we laugh about that, and we talk about that, but there's two things that are important for us to remember. When it comes to the church, this community of grace, it is grace that will cultivate the humility to say, listen, there is nothing good in me but Jesus. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. He has raised me to glorious life, but he has given me gifts. And it's not about my self-esteem. It's about trusting God's goodness. Grace cultivates humility. And so he says, when you get this, you recognize this measure of faith because the Bible reminds us you've been saved by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. No one boasts. Amen. So the faith and the grace that has been given to us by Jesus, humility becomes a whole lot easier when I recognize it was all him. So, okay, grace, humility. What does that, what does that mean? That Philippians 2 passage do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more significant than yourselves. Look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how it works for you, but I am selfish, struggle with the idol of comfort, and want things to go my way. And when it comes to these things, that is the antithesis of humility. So when, you know, all the kids are home from college and the boyfriends came and we got the house full and, and everything's happening inside the house and it's buzzing and it's busy, sometimes when things don't go the way that I hope they would, or sometimes when these extra young men that have come to my house devour things that I was planning to eat later, Instead of humility and grace saying, what a gift that we would be under the same roof in a place where relationally there's joy and laughter and conversation around the table, I'm too busy worrying about my own selfish wants. We have to be careful, family, that we recognize the grace has been given by God and walking in humility is what frees us. It's what frees us. From selfishness. He goes on and he says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. There is this unbelievable thing that happens for us when it comes to understanding God's grace. This grace that builds our community. We recognize from Ephesians 4 that we are in Christ. We're being joined together. 
Christ at the head, and he has joined us together and is holding us together. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that right now the whole universe holds together the power of Christ's words. This grace community is held together by Jesus. He is the foundation. He says, upon this rock, upon this understanding that I am the Christ, the Son of God, and that I am going to give my life as a sacrifice and ransom, it is on this understanding, faith with me as the object, that I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. For us at the orchard, a lot of times you'll hear people say things like, family. You listen to Carrie talking. And you hear her say, you know, it's not about just showing up on Sunday. They, they really want me to be family. They've invited me into their homes. They have uh, shared their life with me. I think sometimes when it comes to understanding how community is put together in the church, we get a couple of misconceptions. One, you have limited capacity in time. Everybody in the church can't be best friends with everybody else. You don't have that kind of time. Am I right? So there has to be networks of deep and abiding friendships within the larger network of this community where the grace of God is lived out between each other. And I fear that sometimes when it comes to church, we treat it more like an airport than we do a family. We come in, everybody kind of goes to their gate, whatever that is. Maybe it's the kid gate or the student gate or this gate or a study group gate or whatever it is. We come to our gate and we kind of sit there. We'll make a little bit of a, a loose affiliation, you know, a little small talk. We'll run here and there, but we never really get to know one another. I want you to know when, when it comes to the orchard, we pray by God's grace that when you come in here, you will experience the power of God in a real and tangible way. We pray that you will experience the love of Jesus as we gather. But we also pray that you will connect and that you will become more than just somebody who comes on Sundays, but you will become family who has networks of deep and abiding friendships to help to carry us through when life is difficult. You can't experience the full life of the orchard running in and running out. And so when it comes to understanding these things, we do have, you know, it's kind of like if you read on, well, we don't really use it anymore, but used to, we had this stuff called money, like paper and coins. And if you looked in, in certain ones of those things, in the mouth of the eagle, there would be this little banner, and it said, e pluribus unum, out of the many, one. This is what Paul is talking about. We gather together, and there's all kinds of differences. We need those differences. I, I recognize my weaknesses, and you put me in a group with a lot of people, you will discover my weaknesses very quickly. That's why I need people who have strengths that I don't have around me. He said, we're the body, and we're all different. We're the body, and there's so many of us. But Jesus makes us one. Grace is what builds the community. He goes on, though, and he says, having gifts that differ, I love this, according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Grace gives gifts. Grace gives gifts. If you are in Christ Jesus, God has given you a gift. You are grace gifted. One, he's giving you the grace of eternal life. Some of you are going to be disturbed to know this, but you're all charismatics in here. Some of you are like, I don't even know what you just said. That's all right. When it comes down to it, you're all grace gifted. God distributes these gifts and he gives it. But I love the way that Paul just says, hey, listen, we're, we're actually supposed to use them. I, I'm, I'm one of those guys that sometimes I will... Uh, in, in technology, I feel like if we get something that I need to then get every accessory that comes with it, right? I am the Best Buy salesman's dream client. 
You know, you go in there and the whole idea is, well, let them get whatever they're getting, but then sell them all this other stuff too. I am fertile soil for that. I mean, you walk in there and start looking at TVs. Well, you could get that one, but if you had this, it'll do this. I'm like, oh, ooh. And you probably need like a holder that's like gold plated with extra springs. You need these, you know, HDMI cables that, you know, have this extra coil in the middle of them. And you need a power thing. And I'm going, yeah, I probably need that. Yep, I need that. Mm -hmm. Yep, let's get that too. And put that in there and all that sort of thing. And, and when it comes to understanding these things, it, it, when we understand that God gives us these gifts, the variety of God's design is necessary. God is creative. And the variety of these things and giving ourselves to these things is important. And we need each other because we need all those things to make up the whole. G grace gives gifts. But the point of the gifts is to use them. Because what happens for me then is I get home from Best Buy and I forget in the sack because I got everything, you know, I had so many things in the bag, I forgot to go back and look. And there's two extra adapters that you put as a pre-adapter to the post adapter that helps the other adapter that I didn't even need. And I didn't plug it in, but the TV is working great. And so I don't do anything. And then we have that drawer. It's in our kitchen. I don't know where you guys keep it, but I, I call it the collect all drawer. And so sometimes if a neighbor comes by and they're like, hey, I need like a 1973 uh, cable adapter, I'm like, I probably got that. Let me go to the drawer. Some of you are sitting in the drawer and we need you to get out. We, we need you to get out. God's gifted you. And boy, we need you. Our orchard family needs you. Because the grand reality is it's grace that powers the action. It's grace that powers the action. It's God's grace that, that has established us. It's God's grace that gives us the gifts, but it's God's grace that gives us the power to serve. And we're obligated to serve one another. We are obligated to utilize these gifts. You say, okay, John, I hear you. So what am I supposed to do? Let me give you four things. The first one is this. Remember, the Christian faith is a corporate experience. You say, what does that mean? That means that we're supposed to gather. We're supposed to gather. There, there's no such thing, you know, to quote John Donne, no man is an island. The, the reality for us is when it comes to our life in Christ, there is a part of our life in Christ that is meant to be lived out together. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as is the habit of some but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching, Hebrews says. God's people are made to gather. Some of you felt it over this, this last year. To me, there was nothing worse than finding out, okay, we can't gather for a little while. There's some things that you just can't replicate on the couch. Now, I enjoyed you know, being in my jammies with wild hair and sleepy children. And I enjoyed seeing the interaction online. But there is a part of this that's an embodiment. It would have been not the same if I hadn't at least had those people around me, right? And for some of you right now, you're going, I feel like I'm on that island all by myself. And I want you to know that Orchard loves you. Don't stay on that island. come this way take a risk like Carrie and say you know what I'll, I'll sign up for a Bible study I don't know anybody at this place I just googled it but I need I know I need this the second thing to remember is this love is the fuel for obedience and service love is the fuel for obedience and service when, when Paul goes on in verse 9 he says let love be genuine it, it really comes down to this when it comes to Following Jesus, it's about loving Jesus, not keeping a list of rules. What the Puritans would call the expulsive power of a greater affection. In other words, I love something more than myself. I love something more than this thing. I love Jesus more than anything. Love is the fuel for obedience and service. 
Third thing to remember is this, we need each other. Now listen, I just want to get practical for a minute. The, the grand reality is, you know, things are different since COVID. Some of you are guests here. Some of you are just coming back. I, I, I talked to a friend of mine last week. This guy has had a double lung replacement. And last Sunday was his first time to break out. I told him I would hug you, but I don't want you to catch anything from me. But it was one of those things where he said it was so great just being together. I want you to know, Orchard family, we need each other. We need each other. Don't let the orchard just be another stop in an already busy week. Let it be an oasis where you refuel, where you come hang out with your friends and your family, where we all look toward heaven and remember that we've got hope where we put our arms around people who are crushed and crying, and we tell them we love them and we cry with them, where we raise our arms and celebrate around those who have had an incredible week and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Let laughter ring and coffee be sipped, and by God's grace, may donuts reappear very soon, right? And the final thing I would say is this. When it comes to understanding all this, the last thing is this. Everybody needs Jesus. Invite other people to be friends with us. Reach out. You never know what is going on around you that just something as simple as saying, hey, would you just join me? Come and there's no strings attached. Just come. We'll go to service. I'll buy you some lunch. I'd love to just hear about your story and talk about where you are in life and see how I can be a better friend to you. We're nearing the high day of the church year, Resurrection Sunday. And as we near Resurrection Sunday, here's your pastoral double dog throw down dare for the playground. I dare all of you to invite just one person to find your one. Maybe you think they're far from God. Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you just know that COVID's messed them up and they're not connected anywhere. I don't know. But just say, hey, come with me. Everybody needs Jesus. We need each other. What an incredible gift for us. It's true. Relationships can be complicated. Church relationships can be complicated. But God's grace and Jesus make it better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing at the orchard. We thank you for stories like Carrie's where we see your work in her life and our life. Because what a gift she's been to us. We hear of her nervousness leaving a a, a place and moving to a new place and having such a close church family. The wondering of, would she find something like that here? So God, I pray that you would remind us that when it comes to the church, the church is not a building, it's a people. And it's a community of grace. It's been founded by Jesus. It's built by Jesus. It's sustained by Jesus. It's gifted by Jesus. And in that, oh God, I pray that you would remind us. And part of our Christian life is meant to be lived corporately. We're a body. We're all a part of the big church, that universal church that you are redeeming and preparing for eternity. But we're also part of the orchard church. So I pray today, God, that people would taste grace and they would understand that Jesus loves them and that we do too. So Jesus, be glorified in your church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. There's going to be people at these tables on either side to pray with you. If you're hurting today and you're like, hey, I just I need somebody to pray with me, please come. If you're online, don't hesitate to reach out. You, you can either text Orchard Next Steps to 94000 or you can email us, info at theorchardchurch.com. 
But if you're hurting and you just need somebody to say you matter and we love you, give us the privilege of doing that. If you say, you know what, I don't even know a whole lot about this church thing, this God thing, this Jesus thing. I'm kind of figuring it out. I'm kind of in that category that I know there's something bigger out there, but I don't know exactly what it is. Or maybe you're just in a place going, you know what, I I've waited too long. I have not stepped in and become family. I've not stepped up and joined orchard teams and serving. Whatever it is, take the next step. I promise you this, you'll never be disappointed in obedience. So let's stand together and let's sing. There's a grace when the heart is undefined. Another way when the walls are when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the walls holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminded of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden. Another died for me. There is another in the fire. There is another in the fire. Yeah. 
Even Shadrach had Meshach and Abednego in the fire. But there was another. And they weren't sure what to do about that. So let me say this to you. If you're here today, you're a guest with us, and you say, hey, listen, I, I need family, I need community, I need connection. I hope that you will stop at the desk out there. There's a guy that looks more like a tree than a man. His name's David Schmidt. He would love to introduce himself and tell you how you can get connected at the orchard. If you're online, text Orchard Next Steps to 94,000. If you're ready to step up and say, you know what, I know we need each other and I'm ready to use my gifts, I'm ready to step in and serve, stop at that desk and tell them. But no matter where you are in life, know this, you are not alone. Everyone who belongs to Jesus has a friend that is closer than a brother. And when the flames get high around you and the battle looks like it's going to consume you, don't give up. There is always hope in Jesus. Orchard family, as you go from this place, be family, live with purpose, make disciples. Thanks for being at the Orchard. We'll see you very soon.